All right, we're in uh, Acts chapter number 18. If you'll open your Bible, pick it up. We're going to pick up a uh, reading of the text in the 24th verse. And if you're following along in our notebook, we're on page 225. So 1824 of Acts. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. Being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Well, this is uh, one of the uh, premier figures of the book of Acts. Uh, secondarily, and, and I, what I mean by that is not, not top billing, but uh, this is one of the uh, uh, secondary characters that gets uh, some attention here, and a lot of lessons can be learned from this individual named uh, Apollos. If you want to read with me our introduction to this, John Wooden, who is a famed UCLA basketball coach, said, and I quote him, what really counts in life is what you learn after you know it all. Uh, an interesting thought. I think I know what Mr. Wooden meant when he said that. Uh, he was kind of sarcastic about it, but I look back at myself when uh, I was a young man um, in my early 20s, I would say, uh, I was of the persuasion that I had things down pretty good. I knew what life was all about. Looking back on my experiences to that point, I had figured things out. One of the things that I couldn't understand is why people, uh, sometimes smart people, didn't see life or didn't see things exactly the same way I did. I thought, you know, what's wrong with these people? Um, and, you know, I guess... Most of us, when we're young, we're that way. We get to a place, I don't know if it's 16 or 18 or 20 or 25, somewhere in that range, being a young, a late teenager, young adult, that we think we finally got things completely figured out. So I think Mr. Wooden is uh, uh, being a little bit sarcastic, playing off that thought that, you know, by the time you're 25, you got life all figured out. It's really what you learn after that that counts. Uh, and uh, I would agree. I would agree with him for sure. So, uh, just some thoughts along this these lines. Here's a fella named Apollos, who obviously was a very uh, knowledgeable. He was a great speaker, very knowledgeable individual, a great speaker, uh, accomplished in his day. Uh, in fact, uh, probably had many followers himself. But here he is, he's teaching, but he hasn't actually been confronted by the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. The text uh, tells us that uh, uh, a little bit later on that he was a, uh, a um, disciple of John the Baptist. He really didn't have the whole picture yet. You can, you can understand that in a day without internet, without television, without all the technology and communication technologies that you and I enjoy, that uh, word of mouth uh, took uh, a long time to take a truth from one person to the next person to the next person to the next place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we see uh, Apollos in several other uh, places in uh, the New Testament. They're listed below. He's mentioned about 10 times, and he can be located in Ephesus and Corinth. We don't know a lot about him, but we do know that he was a very powerful speaker and a very influential man. 
The passage describes Apollos as, quoting the scriptures, eloquent, mighty in the scriptures, fervent, diligent, bold. No doubt he was a brilliant individual and noted for his leadership. In chapter 19, in verse 3, we note this, that, um, uh, and let's pick it up there. Let's just go over to chapter 19 in our Bibles and read in chapter 19. It says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. So here we uh, see a group of people that uh, have not uh, been presented with the whole gospel, uh, like Apollos, and uh, um, Aquila and Priscilla have taken Apollos uh, under their wings, so to speak. And uh, uh, other believers, uh, we note here, uh, believers of John's baptism, people who were inclined to accept uh, what was taking place in their world, that the Messiah was coming, that they should repent, they should prepare themselves for the kingdom is at hand and all of that, that uh, um, Apollos was one of those individuals himself and he needed to be schooled further in the understanding the gospel. Notice on page 226, although Apollos was mighty, diligent, he was a disciple of John the Baptist. He had not been educated in the gospel of Christ. The one outstanding characteristic of Apollos that stands out among the rest is his teachability. Teachability. That's an important quality or characteristic in an individual. Several years ago, I asked our school principal, a very uh, highly revered individual in our church and in our community, I might add. He had been a public school principal before he became the principal of our Christian school. His name was Nick Fabry. Nick is 80 years old now and re retired for some time, but I remember asking Nick this. I said, what is the singularly most important quality or characteristic that you look for in a prospective teacher. Obviously, he was charged with the responsibility of hiring teachers for our school, both elementary and uh, middle and high school. And uh, he, he didn't even, uh, he he didn't hesitate at all. He responded with teachability. That's what he said, teachability. He said, if, if I've got a a reasonably well-educated and intelligent individual, I can teach them how to be a good teacher and what they need to know to be successful in the classroom. And of course, that makes sense, does it not? Teachability speaks of humility, a person that can honestly admit and say, you know, I really don't know it all. I ended a class recently uh, in our Bible Institute, we were talking about uh, we were talking about a particular subject, a particular passage in the Bible that is one of the more difficult passages of the Bible. And I gave several different takes on you know how that passage is interpreted by different groups of individuals. And rather than um, condemning or criticizing anybody that disagreed with me I said this and I kind of went in that direction and then I stopped and I said purposely I said this is what we need to remember we need to be humble be humble George Grace doesn't have a corner on the market of Bible knowledge and understanding I am a lifelong student and at my age now, I've been studying the Bible for 45, 46, 40, maybe my 47th year now. And I am still learning. I can tell you things that I've learned in the last month from Scripture, from other people, from conversations, from reading books, from reading my Bible. I'm still learning. 
And I enjoy that. When you come, or if you ever come to the place and you say, you know, I really got it down. I know. I know. I've got, I am the final answer on this. To the point where you become argumentative and um, unnecessarily unkind, uh, sarcastic, uh, demeaning, critical in your disagreements with someone who disagrees with your particular position. Listen. Be humble. You may be right. I'm not saying you're wrong. But be humble. You may have to eat your words someday. What I say is to the best of my ability and from what I have read and understood and taught over all my years of ministry, this is what I believe to be true about this passage. Now I'm aware that there are alternate beliefs and that there are good reasons for those beliefs. It's not that I just totally outright reject them. But this is the position that I take now. But at the same time, I want to be humble. I may be wrong. That is so important. And Apollos had to be willing, as influential, as powerful as he was, as eloquent as he was, he had to submit himself to the leadership and teaching and discipleship of Aquila and Priscilla. It's what you learn after you know it all that counts, Wooden said. Wooden also said this. He said, if I am through learning, I am through. Remember that. You're through. Prejudice, Shelley said, prejudice against all things new is self-defeating and unworthy of people made in the image of God. There is no uninterested ideas, only disinterested people. By the way, if you'll pay attention and listen to the positions and the reasoning why people accept or take alternate or conflicting positions to your position, you will learn something. You will either learn that maybe you're wrong or you will be able to answer those objections and it will only confirm you in your beliefs that you are correct in what you believe about that issue. So, don't ever be afraid to discuss things and then if you don't have an answer, say, I'll go and find an answer for this. I can't answer that right now, but I'll go find an answer and we'll get back together and talk about it a little bit more. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace be humble, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to give you, in this lesson, this is, uh, this is more than just studying the book of Acts. This is kind of a teaching, preaching moment on uh, how to be a better person, I suppose. So if, I can, if you'll give me the permission to share this with you, I think this could be very helpful. This has been very helpful to me. Allow me to give you seven words that represent the characteristics of a Christian man or woman who has a teachable spirit. If teachability is such an important thing, Mr. Fabry, and that's what he said, what are the characteristics of a person who has a teachable spirit? How do you really know if they're teachable? We've listed at the bottom of page 226, we've listed seven words they all begin with the letter H, an alliteration on the word H. At the top of the next page, we've listed, or I've listed several opportunities in our ministry that, to learn Scripture. Teachable people are the types of people who are in classes like you're in right now. You want to know more. I don't know what your motivation for that is, and I hope that it's pure, but um, it, you're teachable because you're saying, I want to hear. Unless you're just sitting there to uh, listen to me and criticize me and say, what a buffoon that grace is. He has no idea what he's talking about. I'll be humble. Maybe that's true. I don't know. I don't think that's true, but that could be true. But anyway, notice on the following pages, these H's are spelled out. We've taken we've written down some comments on each one of them and you can ask yourself these questions I don't have to spend a lot of time doing them but we'll move through number one ask yourself am I really teachable 
all of the good advice in the world will not help you if you don't have a teachable spirit. Are you open to the ideas of other people? Do you listen more than you talk? Are you open to changing your opinion on the basis of new information? Not just any information, but factual information? Do you readily admit when you're wrong? Are you willing to ask questions and expose your ignorance? Do you act defensively when you're criticized? Are you open to doing things in a way that you have never done them before? Not immorally, not foolishly, but are you open to new ways of doing good things? Pride is the chief enemy of the teachable spirit. The core truth of the wooden quote is an attack on the know-it-all spirit. And that's basically what Wooden is attacking. The more I learn, the more I realize that I don't know. Be humble. Be humble. Abject stupidity is simply not knowing how stupid you really are. (laughs) Hunger is number two. The most important thing about education is appetite. Do you have an appetite for learning the Bible? Or does the Bible just kind of sit off there in the corner somewhere and you never really uh, spend time studying it, relating to it? Or are you uh, eating it up regularly? Maybe even, you know, what's the next course you're going to take in your Bible Institute? Or what are you pursuing to gain more knowledge so you can be a better Christian and, and be a better teacher and be a better example to others? Hunger is so important. It is the ignorant who despise education. I like Galozzi's quote that follows, we have an innate desire to endlessly learn, grow, and develop. We want to become more than what we already are. Once we yield to this inclination for continuous and never-ending improvement, we lead a life of endless accomplishments and satisfaction. That's quite a quotation. Let's move on. Let's move to the next one. You can read. Heart. Heart is number three. Being aware of the value and brevity of life, man should with fervent intent seek with the, with the center and essence of his being the wisdom of God. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. It's the most important thing that you'll ever gain in life is the wisdom of God. Read the book of Proverbs. Eat the book of Proverbs. I would read the book of Proverbs, uh, uh, and I do read the book of Proverbs probably three times a year just to go through it. There's about 900 or so verses in that book. doesn't take that long to read it, but it is so rich and so vital. To, to our uh, spirituality and our Christian, and your common sense, I might add, too. A pure and holy heart. A pure and holy heart opens the door to the most valuable of all knowledge, the wisdom of God. So you have to have a heart. Apply our hearts unto wisdom. Number four here. In addition to humility and hunger and heart, We need to get into the habit of listening, listening. Someone said you can learn nothing while you're talking. (laughs) That's me. I do a lot of talking. I'm not learning a whole lot. I got to get someplace quiet (laughs) and stop talking so I can can learn. So do you, by the way. If you're talking, you're not learning anything. Now, it's good to talk if you've got something to say and uh, share with someone else, but... uh, Just talking for talking's sake is not very profitable. Two ears, one mouth. Listen twice as much as you speak. Some people say you ought to be listening ten times as much as you speak, but I don't have ten ears, so that ain't going to work out. Of course, we need to listen to God. Proverbs gives us a contrast of being wise and learning versus refusing to learn. All of those passages deal with that. Look at all of them. How important that is in the book of Proverbs. Remember, a growing Christian is always learning no matter how old or how well educated. 
I don't care if you're a pastor, associate pastor, missionary, youth director. I don't care if you're 75 or 25. We all should be learning. We all should be growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hope is number five. The teachable spirit looks forward. He sees that the accumulation of godly wisdom and knowledge will have a valuable use in that person's life and the lives of others in the future. I've watched about 125 men and women graduate from our Bible Institute. Every one of them t took a minimum of 100 credit hours of courses to graduate from North Star Bible Institute. I've watched them the day they walked into the first class at North Star Bible Institute, and I see many of them, many of them, missionaries and pastors today as a result. They started with little or nothing, and they have grown systematically, uh, uh, regularly, consistently, and uh, watch them move from into leadership in their churches and ultimately starting pastoring churches or leading groups in churches or whatnot. I've seen that and I've got a, life, uh, a lifetime of experience watching people start and people get to uh, gain incredible amount of wisdom, knowledge, and have influence for the gospel of Christ, both here and around the world. So, uh, this, uh, we ought to have hope. A teachable spirit looks forward to a better day in his life. Wisdom and knowledge add value to the teacher and to his students. Help is number six on page 229. Dr. Uh, Krasier writes, the character of teachability has two aspects to it. One is being a learner and the other is to pass it on to share insights and what we have learned with others to disciple them. It never means being condescending or thinking that we know it all. L let me ask you this. You're in a classroom right now taking the book of Acts. This is a function of discipleship. Right now you're a disciple and you're a um, moderator, your teacher, myself, we are kind of facilitating this class in this course. So we are the disciplers, if you please. You are the disciple. Now, let me ask you this. Who are you passing it on to? Who's your disciple? Who do you have in your church or someone in your life that you're taking the information and the wisdom and the knowledge that you're gaining through your uh, endeavors, through your studies, through, through your classes and courses, who's the person that's the recipient or the beneficiary of all that you are learning? You need, to find, you need to find someone like that. You need to have someone like that. Oftentimes churches have ministries that provide situations where there are people who want to be discipled and people who have qualified themselves to be disciples. I encourage you to get involved in some kind of discipleship relationship, not just being the, the student, but you as the teacher having someone who is your student. You will probably learn as much being the teacher as you will being a student of another teacher. So help. Who are you helping? And then the last thing on the list is habit. Habit. Did you ever seriously consider and evaluate how you use the most precious commodity of your life, your time, my time? We're all given 24 hours a day. We all do not have the same responsibilities or challenges, but all of us have some free or discretionary time. Get in the habit of valuing your listening and reading time at roughly 10 times your talking time. This will assure you that you are on a course of continuous learning and self-improvement. He who stops being better stops being good, Cromwell said. Now some questions follow us here at the bottom of the page quickly. What happens to your relationship with God, with others, and with the opportunity God gives you when you 
refer, you refuse to learn or when you feel that you have had enough discipleship. We all should be learning. What would improve in your life if you were more teachable and weren't so proud and arrogant? What can you do to assure that discipleship is a pro top priority in your life? And how can you be involved, not only as the student, but how can you be involved as the teacher? And will you be involved? And will you get into the habit of lifelong learning? Lifelong learning. Remember what the title of our lesson was. It's what you learn after you know it all that counts. You may be in the best time of your life. You've got experience behind you. You've got some education. You've got a vocation. You may have a family. You've, you've learned a lot in life. And here you are right now, poised to go forward, maybe to do the ultimate thing that God has planned for you in your life. This is the time that you could and should be willing to learn more than you've ever learned before in your life. Build upon your experience and build upon your education.